And, um, you know how the universe plays little jokes on you from time to time? Um, I had it all figured out. That was my first mistake. <laughs> um, that because of all the activity here this weekend, I would just recycle a sermon. You know, let's not try and write anything brand new. Um, and that, that was going to be a great plan. I've, and there was a great one from a couple of years back. We'll just pull that one out, dust it off. It'll be great. And then I woke up at 3.45 on Thursday morning. I'm like, where is that sermon after all? <laughs> So because it was 3.45 in the morning, I had to just get up and go look for it, right? right. Yeah, no. It's on a hard drive somewhere in storage. So good sense would have been, we'll just find another sermon. But that would have been good sense. So no, instead, at 4 o'clock in the morning, I sat down and I rewrote the sermon. I like to think it's better. We'll find out. Of all the things that we were taught in seminary, uh, we never got an actual lesson in how to conduct a prayer, which is odd because we were praying all the time. Uh, you know, just let me get through this. Um, but we never got schooled in the how and the why and the if or the when of prayers. You know, we we had sermon, uh, we had preaching class where. Uh, sermons were diagrammed and it was the ark and the we, we we were taught how to sit and be with people in their worst moments we were expected to just kind of know how to pray i think this reveals an odd gap in our unitarian universalist way of doing things right now um it's 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 a it's a ambivalence it's an and by ambivalence I mean that we don't really care. By ambivalence meaning we can see that there's some good, but we can't quite you know, so um, so we never got taught. And 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 I think that same ambivalence is how sometimes in our congregations we wind up having little spats over what to call that part of the sermon or the service where we're all supposed to kind of just sort of sit together. Um, is this a time for prayer? Is this reflection? Is this meditation? We'll just call it all three and leave it up to you to decide. I think some of this ambivalence is because the word prayer comes with a whole lot of baggage. Some of it not very good baggage. And so people will reject the whole word because of the baggage. I've seen it happen. And what's the difference between prayer and meditation? Again, I've asked people, I have yet to have a really conclusive explanation. For me, personally, um, the difference is whether I am stilling myself, pulling myself to one still point, am I here to heal or am I here to observe? Prayer for me is for healing. Meditation is for observation. But that's just me. You might do it differently. Okay, so with this imprecise beginning, let's go consider some of the classical forms of prayer and what we might make of them. Okay. The most familiar, the most baggage-laden form is intercessionary prayer. Okay, big word. It's asking for intercession from outside of one's own abilities, um, asking for a God, maybe, to intercede on one's behalf. I used to call this kind of prayer the sparkly pony prayer, um, as in, dear God, please bring me a sparkly pony. I used to dismiss this whole thing as kind of an immature form um, uh, of, 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 of negoti a negotiation, uh, a transactional relationship, uh, bargaining with a powerful God who could do something to intervene and change everything. 
if I do this, you do that, please. This is the kind of prayer that young people quickly learn cannot be dependent on. This is the kind of prayer that it gets really easy to scoff at as, as the words that are useless, naive, immature, unsophisticated. This is the kind of prayer that breaks the most young hearts. Dear God, please help Daddy quit drinking. Dear God, please bring my kitty back. Those are the prayers where people get lost. So I had my baggage about it, but I've softened. Maybe it's because I've seen more pain and more suffering, the helplessness that we all have. Now, my understanding of intercessionary prayer has changed. Now, I understand it is not just a negotiation. It's not just necessarily a pleading. I see that it can also be an opening up, a letting go of that narrative that I'm alone. It's asking for help in breaking that illusion of separateness. And it is asking simply to not be alone in the struggle. It doesn't even have to be a prayer to a separate or supernatural. It can simply be a call, a call to be made aware of how I am connected. Here's another classical form of prayer. It's a variation on the intercessionary prayer. It's, it's, but rather than praying for one's own interest, it's, it's praying for another, right? And this can be a bit tricky. It all depends on um, the tone because it can even seem a bit disempowering, a bit disconnecting, but it all comes down to tone, I think. Oh, oh and, and here's another detail. All of the stories this morning are about Unitarian Universalists, except for one, and that's my dear Aunt Ruth. Um, one day, my dear Aunt Ruth was minding her own business, standing in her kitchen, when all of a sudden she just dropped to the floor and had a seizure, and clean, clean out of the blue. And it was terrifying. It was scary. It was disruptive. Um, uh, it, it was... <laughs> all these medical tests and, and she couldn't drive for an entire year. And, and that was really pretty hard. It was hard on her family, her husband, her three school age sons. And as she got better and, you know, started about trying to get things done, too many of her neighbors would see her and look a little nervous. And then they would say kindly um, for whatever their own reasons were, we're praying for you. And that just irked the snot out of her. <laughs> praying for me. What the hell good is that going to do for me? I need help getting the kids to school. I need help getting the groceries home. Praying for me? Here's the part with that, a little, little problem with that whole phrase, um, I'm praying for you, because um, like so many other things, it really depends on tone, which probably depends on what's in the heart of the person who's speaking, because um, it can start to really quickly sound kind of judgy, kind of pitying. There's a little bit of the, I'll pray for you, <laughs> since it's so obvious your own prayers aren't doing squat. <laughs> It can sound as if the person who's offering the prayers has a tighter relationship with the divine and, <laughs> and their God is going to do more than yours, obviously, you poor wretched mess. 
Okay. Here's a flip, though. Here's a flip. A man I know explained how when his mother was dying, it was so hard. It was so hard. And a friend of the family made a donation to a Catholic convent. You know, you're, we're Unitarians, right? But upon receipt of that donation, the nuns at the convent began including his family in their daily prayers. That was reported back to this man, and rather than feel that his friend had deemed his own prayers insufficient, this man instead felt supported, connected, cared for, as, as if his burden was being shared, as if his suffering was being recognized. I really think it does have to do with tone. Here's another twist on prayer for another person. Um, one day the phone rang. It was another mom from our son's class. I, I didn't know her that well, but there was something in her voice I had never heard. I need to ask something of you, but I, I don't know where to begin because I'm going to just start crying. I promised to cry with her. She explained that her husband had just been diagnosed with a brain cancer, glioblastoma. It's, it's, it's a really rapid, really deadly form of cancer. Her husband was going to die. And in the meantime, six months, a year, 18 months tops, she was going to need somebody to help her pick up the kids after school. She was going to need somebody to help keep an eye on them while well, she sorted everything out. Of course I can do that. Of course. I'll pick them up. I prayed, too, but not an intercessionary prayer asking for some kind of cure or change, miracle. No. It, it was a different kind of prayer. Um a prayer of attention, a prayer of service. You know how we say, love is the doctrine of this church and service is its prayer? That's what this prayer looked like. When I prayed, I kept Lisa and Jim and the boys in my heart. Not to pity or distance, not to turn their suffering over to a God. I, I, I kept them close so that I would remember to pick up the phone. I would remember to just double whatever we were fixing for dinner so that I could take some. I, to remember to watch them closely for ways that we could be there to help if they faltered or fell. My prayers for them were really a way to change me, to make me more open to their needs. This is what Kierkegaard was pointing out when he explained, prayer doesn't change God but it changes him who prays. And what kind of prayer would Kierkegaard, that good old existentialist, what, what kind of prayer was he inclined to make? Here's one from Kierkegaard. Oh, Lord God, I have nothing to ask of you. Even were you to promise to fulfill my every wish, I can think of nothing but this, that I might remain with you and stay as near to you as possible in this time of separation when you are in heaven and I am on earth and be with you entirely for all eternity. Mm. 
Okay. Simple as can be. No. Here's a simpler one. A simpler prayer. Not the simplest, but I like it. When faced with difficult moments, um, a man I know simply asks, let this go well. He doesn't even necessarily know what well might be. Um, that's important here. He understands, he accepts that his ability to understand what well might be, his ability is limited. He cannot truly know what well might be, so he has to loosen his desire for control or, or even to fully understand. He has to release his simple play, prayer. Let this go well. Notice that he's not addressing an omnipotence. He's leaving it open to every particle and participant so that we can all be part of letting things go well. Yeah. Here's another form of prayer. Um, it's, it's not intercessionary. It's, it's more participatory. It's, it's ritual wherein prayer can arise. Each morning, a woman I know gets up and heads out to her patio. She brings with her a pitcher of water, a big cup of birdseed, and an ear of dried corn. She fills the bird bath with the water. She fills the bird feeders. She places the ear of corn out for the squirrels. And then she sprinkles some of the bird seed into a circle on the ground and divides it into four to represent the four directions of the earth. And then she drops a few peanuts into each section for the Blue Jays. As she does this, she is invoking the power of the earth and she is creating the new day right there on her patio. Sometimes it's raining. Most of the time, the birds and the squirrels are hopping about in the trees, waiting for her to go inside. Perhaps there are words that go along with this prayer. I don't know them. But I like to think that if there were words, they would be words like, Yes. Now. Thank you. The weather's changing. Okay. Here's one last story. I asked a friend of mine who's a chaplain. She's an atheist. Atheists can make for very good chaplains. But as part of her work, she has to pray with people. All the time. Now, like a good chaplain, she meets people where they are theologically. She doesn't impose her theology. She finds where they are. But she has to bring her own understanding to give her strength. She understands that these prayers that she must do are form like of the Buddhist metta meditations that are seeking wholeness, peace. She explained this process to me. She says, praying with them is giving words, giving words to all their deepest fears, to their deepest needs, to their deepest love, and then saying these words out loud. It's a very loving act that people do for each other. Notice that there is no separated supernatural here. It's the immediate human experience of connection. So, if you're ever wondering, can atheists pray? Oh, yes. They can pray 
very clean, pure prayers. What is the simplest prayer? How and when and, and why should it be done? Here, I hold with Meister Eckhart. If the only prayer you say in your entire life is thank you, it will be enough. It will be enough. Blessed be. Amen.